Hello and welcome to the bottom of it with your host Joshua Moriarty. Yeah, welcome to episode 66 of The Bottom of It. Pleasure to be back. Always nice to be sharing these conversations with you. Seems to be a monthly thing at the moment. Potty a month. I think that's fine, right? You could listen to a million others with an episode or two a week. But come on, it's kind of a little bit overkill, guys. Don't you think sometimes, maybe? Or is that just my excuse for being slack? But hey, I've had a bunch going on. And no one pays me huge huge money for this, so i got to do it on my own schedule. Got my new solo record, Melancholia, coming out this week. Go give it a spin. Send me a DM to my other folder on Instagram and tell me it's dog shit. I'd appreciate it. Uh, What else is going on? Telenova is hitting the stage again as well. Got a bunch of shows across Australia. Life finally feels like it's kind of back to normal. Wow, how about that? There you go. Just everyone suddenly... That was weird, wasn't it? It was all a bit weird. Anyway, we're back. Uh, All right, enough ramble, ramble. Today's episode is with musician extraordinaire Davey Lane. Now, you may know Davey from being the lead guitar player in UMI, but that's just one of the many projects he's been involved with over the years. He's also got a whole swath of solo records. He's played in Crowded House, put together a band for Todd Rundgren, toured around Australia with him. He's done some incredible Beatles tribute shows with some Aussie Muso guns playing entire Beatles records front to back. He's a music machine that never stops running. His latest solo record, Don't Bank Your Heart On It, features guest artists like Todd Rundgren, Stu McKenzie from King Gizzard, Jimmy Barnes, Vicar and Linda, fellow bandmate Timmy, uh, Timmy Rogers, I was about to say, but I don't know if Tim would appreciate being called Timmy. Don't know him well enough to say that at all. Davey has been a very respected part of the Australian music community for many years and is a bloody lovely guy to boot. Uh, I think everyone really, really likes Davey. It was a pleasure to sit down and have a proper chat. We had met many years ago. We were trying to figure it out somewhere in WA when both Miami Horror and UMI did a little festival show together. He's also recorded a solo record with Shit Hot, I've written here. Shit Hot producer Tony Buchan, who I've been talking about a lot. Tony produced Davey's record, A Tonally Young, and he also produced my new record, Melancholia. So we love Tony. We talk about him a little bit. We have a bunch of mutual friends, but I never had a proper chance to bro down and talk all things music so it was a pleasure to get to do that we definitely rant on about the Beatles a bunch of course that was always going to come a mutual love for Supergrass and all things Alan Partridge what it was like for Davey working with Neil Finn and Todd Rundgren and a whole bunch of other stuff so all right let's get into it episode 66 with Davey Lane enjoy here we go this is it for the podcast. I use Garage Band because Ableton's bad recording long stuff. Right. It freaks out a little bit. Like yeah, the first okay. few podcasts, it started just wigging out at like 20 minutes in or something. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. It's made for DJs for recording like someone for three minutes at the most. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then now it's changed. Now everyone's kind of using it. But yeah, yeah, that was my foray because the Miami Horror guys all started using it. So I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I've yeah. just been, co- you just copy whoever was in front of you a little bit really I yeah like. exactly yeah yeah and i just would watch them like all right cool i guess i'll do that but yeah i'm starting to get decent at using the computer now i mean it's been maybe I, it's hard to you forget how long time has been since you did something yeah maybe it's been 12 years of me using a computer and making music that should mean i'm actually like decent enough now isn't it Ah, uh, yeah, I <laughs> not necessarily. No, nah, I'm. I, I've like every time I, f- I figure out a shortcut or a, oh, like a little computer command. Uh, like every time shift. I figure out a short, I, yeah. I just I um. It's always a revelation, but I always lament the amount of time that I've wasted going the long way. Yeah, line. that's but that's <laughs> that's just life. There's nothing you can yeah. do. It's good when you open an old session or you listen to an old song you've done and you realize that it's way shitter and that you've gotten better. That's always a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I've kind of gone back to, I do go back to old songs that I've, you know, like if I've, if I've, 
figure out there's maybe a bit of an old song I never used that I could maybe use I and mean, oh that that old verse that I liked in that the rest of the song might have been shit but yeah going back to it and thinking like oh fuck what the what the hell was I doing it's like oh you know like now you you figure out how to use auxiliary channels and all that kind of Whoa, thing it's blown like, my mind auxiliaries yeah <laughs> I think I've only just maybe figured that out. Like sends, sending things uh, to stuff. I, yeah, it's a, it's a. Well, then you hang out with someone like Tony Buchan, and they're just like but the guy. The thing about him as well, though, like he's kind of got it all. He's a motherfucker bass player. Like, yeah, he's a really incredible musician. He knows all of music. Yeah, and then but then also can do all of the really nerdy stuff, technical side of it. But then with yeah. songwriting and getting performances out of you and all of that is good as well there's not many Abs- that can do all of that absolutely and that's why you know that's why he's he's so, yeah that's why uh, it, it, the juggling act of oh, and he can cook as well i know that's right <laughs> uh, yeah man i've 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 had a couple of cook-ups at his place and he's um <laughs> He's a, his skill is deft. Yeah. Yeah. I can't really do anything but music. I'm not really good at anything else. Yeah, I'm 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 the same. And that's the thing I was talking to to a friend about um who was saying the kind of a uh, fellow musician saying that kind of like oh, you know, through this time of covid they're at a little bit of a crossroads because it's uh, do I fig- figure out how to do something else and it's like I don't I, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't think, I, I don't know how to do anything else and I don't have the attention span. Well, kind of desire a little as well, right? Exactly, like, yeah. You know, if music, it, I'm probably the same as you where it's just, once it started, that was all I was ever going to do. Yeah. And I've never changed and never really wanted to do anything else. Occasionally something comes along that you enjoy for a little while, but music's always... And it's just always going. So exactly, yeah. And I'm like, if I don't have that sort of passion for something else, I'm like, I'll just fuck it. <laughs> exactly, because you know what it's like to have a true passion for something. And and music is the kind of thing where it can be all encompassing in you, terms of like you know like it's in terms of picking up new technical skills with and whatnot. And for me, like you know, like I I it's my you know, like when I'm not working on music, I'm doing something. I'm, you know, I'm listening to records, or I'm, I'm, yeah, you know, like reading about I'm someone, reading about some, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all and and to you know, I've spoken spoken to people who um who have been to, through VCA and that kind of thing, and 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 it's like, oh, why are you so obsessed with? The Beatles or something like that. It's like, well, it's, so that is a thing with the jazz, the deep jazz people. It is a little bit, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, maybe what they eventually get grow out of it once, like they're five years out of jazz school, right? But there's a point there when they don't think it's good enough. But that see, that's strange to me because like the chord progressions of the Beatles are just as intelligent. Exactly. As any, yeah, like, I mean, maybe that's, yeah, like, yeah. I don't need, oh, the jazz gets a little much for me. Yeah, I, would like, I you know, I'm not a jazz, you know, I, I love a lot, I, you know, like, you know, somebody played me, uh, uh, the, is it the Ornette Coleman record? The, right. Is there some, there's like the record, like the yeah, kind of blue what's it kind of. It's like the, the future sound of jazz or something like okay. that. And it blew my head off, but like, it's something I can't. I can appreciate it, and it's it's not it's it's not something I can really I feel comfortably immersed. Well, well they're not. In. I guess. Do you like songs? They're not. It, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not songs in a traditional sense. Yeah, exactly. And then that is why I love the Beatles because they created like modern pop music. And th- and that's the thing for me. It was like explaining to. Um, to my friend that it was like, why are you so obsessed with the Beatles? And I'm like, well, that was my mu- music. I never went to school to learn music, but I had the, you know, I had the chord book yeah. and it was from, um, you know, immersing myself in that, that I figured out, oh, what's the, you know, like, and before I even knew any kind of theoretical stuff, it was like, wow, well, why does that chord there, like, it's mm. really jarring change or why does that, 
you know, why does that make me feel like that? And, so you, and was, you didn't, you've had no sort of formal musical education? No. I mean... Guitar the, teachers at school or something? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the guitar teacher at school was basically, he would have Total Guitar magazine and he would <laughs> like photocopy... <laughs> <laughs> he, okay, today we're going to learn one by Metallica, and here's the tab for it. Yeah. And did you have to have to learn the Sultans of Swing solo or anything like that? that there was definitely, yeah, yeah. Was there was definitely one. some some nofflering yeah. going on. <laughs> which uh, I saw this doco a few weeks ago called um, "Under the Mountain" about uh, Air Studios in Montserrat, which George Martin right made and. Like everyone recorded there. There's interviews with um, Sting, Andy Summers. Yep. So the police did a couple of okay. records there, and McCartney did recorded there, and Rush and like Dire Straits did Brothers in Arms there, and it, you just uh, yeah, I used to the Dire Straits fell out of favour with me for 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 quite a while, but it's funny. I was talking to. A fellow guitar player this morning, Ash Naylor, who and we were I talking. I know that name, but I don't know. He plays his his own band is called Even. Okay. Um, they're a great band, but he plays with. I'm actually playing with him on Saturday with uh, Vicar and Linda. We're playing at. Oh, the, cool! Pl- yeah, playing at the Music Bowl. Ah, oh, great! Um, Fun. It. I know. Yeah. Music. Music in front of people again. Who'd have thought? Was but, there? Hang on. Was there something where they were going to try and not pay the artist at that Music Bowl thing? What's that, sorry? Someone, my sister said she was, someone was like, one of her friends was going to be doing that music bowl mm. gig and the council was, for, there was a moment there where they thought they weren't going to be paying that really? for some reason. I, look, I don't know if it's true. Right. That was the story. Well, I'm a subcontractor of okay, one of the so, artists, yeah, so that's up to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're getting paid. No, I think eventually they were like, they were paying everyone because it's like, hang on, how the, like, what do they expect to, how are they going to get all these people to do it? Yeah. Anyway, sorry, please continue. I've interrupted. Um, but we, we we're actually talking about this thing of, of bands like Dire Straits. Um, we, this is quite tangential here, but the like, whole but that, this podcast, <laughs> really, that's all that really happens. But we're that, that, that thing of, of, you know, 80s pop music and, um, you know, like obviously growing up as a as a youngster, and uh, we'll grow. Well, you know, I grew up appreciating that stuff at the time, and then when I started learning about, um, you know, getting deeper into kind of more more serious music, I mm-hmm. uh, you know that's when eighties pop stuff falls out of favour. But as a as an older person, you come back to things like. Die Straits and even like cookie cutter eighties like Trevor Horn eighties yep. pop stuff and you go, it's actually pretty fucking amazing. Like, Trevor it's... Horn was on something for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he was on a mission. Yeah, Die Straits. I know exactly what you mean. It, like the technicality of the guitar playing when you're a teenager seems so like beyond what you could do. So you really admire them. Absolutely. And then I think once you get good enough to be able to do all that, you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you play in a way that maybe I wouldn't want to do. Yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah. I, I, one of my first memories playing the guitar was, you know, one of those sitting in the lounge room, my fingers are bleeding. And then it, it, I think it was maybe like probably around the time of Brothers in Arms or maybe a bit later, but um, uh, Dire Straits were on TV and there was, Noff in his in yeah, the headband, headband on. and yep. just stratting away and play, playing like stratting l- away. Lady Rider on the TV or something like that and and I think I started crying. I was like, well, I can't even do this, but he can do that and he can sing as well. It's like, oh, you- that was that was impossible. The thought of playing the guitar and singing at the same time, the wasn't coordination. It? Yeah, yeah, I remember that as a youngster too. And then yeah, then it just start, I don't know. I guess yeah. What well, so when did you start playing? What's that? When did you start playing guitar? Um, I first probably first started when I was, I don't know. I first remember being bitten by the music bug really early on, like yeah. maybe like seven or eight, um, and it was a combination of the Beatles and the Who for me. And this was your parents, yeah, doing more than anything. Yeah, yeah, more was like their record collection and. Um, 
the Beatles thing came about because my mum and dad had Wings records in their collection. Ah, very so good. So I first the first before the Beatles had got into Wings, and then it was just like, oh, this is really good. And they had Venus and Mars and Band on the Run, which are great records. And and then it was this thing. It's like, well, you know, the guy who's in Wings was in a band before before he was in, yeah, okay. in Wings. He was in the pretty good band. too. <laughs> The guy from Wings. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was basically there. From there, I, was, I, I, I uh, became really um, just a, obsessed with with music on a... Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Just like hearing something like Sgt. Pepper for the first time. And it's just like, this sounds like a kaleidoscope. Yeah. So, you know, it was long before I'd had any awareness of psychedelic drugs, but it, <laughs> it, it sounds like a kaleidoscope. I didn't know how else to describe it. And I was like, how do you do that? Like, how do you like, and like we were talking about chord changes. It's like, how do you, what is it that makes me feel the way I feel mm-hmm. from that chord change? And like, how did, how do you get that sound? Like, what's that sound with that? you know, the echo that goes on and on and on. How do you make that sound? And it was through there that I I first picked up the guitar and it was alongside of guitar, it was started an obsession with with recording and songwriting as well because, yeah. So quite young though. So what, like on recording on what, like a four track? Oh, I had a four track. Yeah, I had a four track when I was probably maybe like um, the... Oh, but actually, before I had a four track, I remember we had two, um, two cassette, cassette decks, and right. it was like you know the the archaic um, form of multi track recording. You'd record something onto one of the yeah, because they had microphones in them, didn't they? Yeah, like, that's kind of right. shitty ones for you to yeah, still record your voice in that. A but. couple of shitty get ghetto blasters, and yep. I had one, and there was one in my sister's room that. Whenever she was out of her room, I'd, I'd steal out of her room and, <laughs> and and put them both together facing each other and then play into one and then play that one and press record on the other one. And, and, and it, uh, well, yeah, one of my other obsessions as well was, was Queen and obviously like Brian May's yep. multi-layered um, style of guitar orchestration. And that was, that was one of the things that I really wanted to try and figure out how to do and it's like play electric guitar and then play a harmony on top of it and record on that. And then so after doing that six times <laughs> It must have sounded I'd play amazing. it but yeah, I'd play it I'd play it back and it's like yeah, like it was somewhere Yeah, somewhere indecipherably like, amongst this like six generations of outside noise and tape is you could hear six layers of David dinner time coming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm still playing. I'm still doing my Brian Mays. So yeah, somewhere like there's this kind of like barely distinguishable six track layer wow. of, of, I'd like to hear that. Is it uh, is like long gone? Long gone. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to hear it actually no, for the best. Yeah, I've got my old 12 track. I, th- I went back through it a couple of years ago because I needed to find something for, I can't even remember what it was. And then there, there was a bunch on there and I was like, yeah, no, nah, I'm done. I don't, I don't need to hear any of these ones ever again. This can safely die. I'm, yeah, I'm the same. In, I, I, well, I like, I like to keep stuff, but I don't necessarily, I, I'm... I guess I'm nostalgic to a point where, like, you know, I it, I found a tape of my high school band. A right, what was your ago. high school band called? Uh, they were called the Odeon Sound. The Odeon Sound, okay. Yeah, because I was into the retro style, and um, I'd looked up what was it? It was like something about because the Pink Floyd's first, well, Pink Floyd's first name was the Pink Floyd Sound. It was like a very ah, like, right happening now. The the happening sound. <laughs> So I was like, oh, if I put it, if I call it the something sound, and then I thought Odeon was uh, had a poster that uh, um, my dad's friend gave me of 
a package to her from the early 60s. And it was the Beatles and Roy Orbison. And it was like oh, yes, of course. playing at South End Odeon. And I was like, oh, Odeon sounds like a pretty retro name. So <laughs> just married the two. And what year are we talking here? Uh, 95, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 95, 90. In the peak of grunge. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the peak of grunge. Doing retro. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and... And then it was just around the corner when it all came back again, but you're like five years too early. Well, it, yeah, exactly. It's like I, I, um, uh, there, yeah. All the other guys in the band were kind of in, more into corn and stuff like that. Yeah, and that I was, was like, I was the guy with the 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 bowl haircut. And then, <laughs> and then when Oasis became massive, it was like, oh, oh yes, you validated. Were. I can have a Beatles haircut <laughs> and. Still get beaten up after school, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, there was this little sense of like, oh, you see, yeah, you know, it is this cool. band are the biggest band in the world now, and they've got those same silly haircuts. Fuck yeah, corn was dreadlocks, wasn't it? A couple of dreads, and then yeah, head the guitar player had the braids, the pokey out uh, braids. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, that band is so weird. I think they may be the most original band of all time because. Yep. Not only like okay, there's seven string guitars with yeah. the most mental like crank, crank, <laughs> and then the drummer would always hit like a sub drop like boom thing on his drums, and then Jonathan Davis would pull out the bagpipes and start playing. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and then he'd do that like kind of scat like ring and ring and ring and then and then then and then Fieldy on the bass like boom boom like slapping yeah like, kind of almost you can't in in like. Can't even hear what he's playing at all. No, yeah, yeah. Like, There's a really bizarre combination Absolutely. of things to happen. Like it's sort of most of the time sounds pretty awful, but occasionally when they got it right, they're like, oh, good on you guys. You're on to you, something. Oh, I I agree. I saw um a recent thing of I think it was like Limp Biscuit playing at Lollapalooza. Yeah. And like I, like playing recently or uh, from back in oh, the day? Oh, playing recently. Right. Yeah. Um and I watched it, and I was just like, and I always had an aversion to Limp Biscuit because the they were the they were it was always the kind of guys at school that would be the you know yeah, the, yeah, the, the jock the yeah. jocks were the Limp Biscuit fans, mm-hmm. and um, so I kind of had an aversion to them for that reason. In the same way that I has as a kid had an aversion to Cold Chisel as well because that ah you know, they, right. They, I was like, oh, that's the band that all of the Tirana guys like. And I can't. Um, uh, but then, you know, later on in life, you, you know, you, you realize how. The Biscuit's got song. some huge riffs. Yeah. yeah. And his guitar sound is massive. So, exactly. And the yeah. drummer's got groove as well. So I was, yeah. Like yeah. now when I go back and hear it every now and again, I was a huge fan at the time. Oh, yep, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, because I was. How old are you? Uh, I'm 40. You're 40. I'm 38. It's not a huge difference, but maybe there was just enough that like... Yeah. You're a, just, you're a few more years advanced where well, like if you're a little younger, it's like you're still... I don't, and also, I don't think I'd like quite had people around me to help me discover what was like where the real deep cool stuff was yet. So yeah. entry level was like starting off with new metal a little bit. Well, I was... Yeah. I mean, I was the same... Growing up, um, kind of discovering what you know. Obviously, you know through the Beatles as the gateway of like you know, and for me it was like all the '60s stuff. And then, did you have a gatekeeper like an older brother or anyone like that? that no, it was all your own mission. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, I, well, yeah. I mean, not in a in a um, familial sense, but um, I think like what once I'd. I first started playing with UMI. I was like, you know, I'd come straight out of school, and they and these and they kind of took me under their wing. As so they, what, how much older are those guys than you? They're probably like ten, know, ten like, years, maybe. Yeah, Tim's about ten, eleven years older than me. Yeah, okay. Than I, I think, and um, yeah. So they were, you know, they were. They were, they really know what's going on it by was that a, point. Yeah, a yeah. market like. Me to think, oh, geez, these guys are really 
quite older than me and they were 28. 29, you know, 28. Yeah, they, they don't seem older than you now. No. <laughs> <laughs> but then, that's a huge difference. Yeah. So, it wasn't until I, I started playing with them and they they, they knew that I that I had, an, you know, a, a, an ear for music and I, I liked, liked some of the good stuff, but mm. it was... Partic- yeah, and particularly like like Rusty, the drummer in UMI, who turned me onto all this incredible like um, freak beat, um, like early, like, you know, like obscure garage psychedelia music from. And there's a whole like that that world of that kind of. I mean, it's 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 kind of how long is a piece of string? Yeah, thing sure. because it's like the amount of like. You know, he's like, oh, there's this band from Paraguay, and they're like, they made a private pressing when they were like, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's it, it never ends. So they're all music nerds as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. cool. So that <laughs> was, yeah, and but I think up until then, I was, yeah, my my thing, even though I was in a band with dudes who were who corn fans and and whatnot, my yeah, I was I was more the on the Brit pop side, yeah. like your super grass, and this all makes sense with the way that your songs work because right. the chords are always doing those changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guilty as charged, sir. <laughs> no, but that's like my favorite thing. Like the way Gaz Coombs moves chords is mm. he's a fucking genius. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny as you get older and you kind of learn more about the stuff that they loved as well like they were into like zapper and and uh, i guess that makes sense because supergrass always had a little bit of silliness in there Uh, not not always but on on occasion they would ham it up wouldn't they exactly yeah they were more playful and a bit yeah they were definitely the yeah definitely the most playful of those kind of bands and it's really bizarre to me that it's always just like this blur and oasis thing, and I'm like, just, has everyone forgotten about Supergrass? I know they are. Yeah, I like, mean, so I, incredibly underrated. Absolutely, and I love, I, I do love both Oasis and I love Blur and Oasis too. Yeah, but yeah. Supergrass is my band. But Super, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I know. Would, and I think like, when I first went to the Big Day Out in 1997. Um, they Supergrass were playing and they came out and played the title track for a minute for the money and it was before the album had come out. So this is the first time I'd heard the song. And did like they go that. into Richard the Third after it? I think that's what they it does did, on the record, actually. doesn't it? Yeah, because yeah. that song yeah. had just come out as a single, but the title track yeah. was no one had heard it and they opened with it and it was just like that kind of... That keyboard that, players of that, that, Yeah, legend. that kind of weird flat 50 kind of chord yeah. that starts and I was like, what is this? And it's just like, as each song, as the song took each progressive step up, I was like, this is the best <laughs> song I've ever heard. And, and I just remember being so excited to um about that particular song like seeing supergrass i was excited but i was so excited to hear that that song i remember going home trying to remember how it went and then because it was then two months later the record came out and i I was skipped school to go to greville records yes to to buy it (laughs) very very good yeah i saw them it was on the, is it the self title record with moving? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. And they were, yeah, it was in Wellington, and yep. they opened with moving. And Gaz just had a spotlight on him at the start, just playing I, moving, keep on moving. moving. And then as it gets into the low, low, oh, the whole yeah. band kicked in, and it was just like fuck. It was so <laughs> yeah, it was huge. Yeah, and I think it was right near the end of their tour, and they were just on fire. It was right. It was amazing. It was like one of those moments I never forget. As yeah, well. yeah. I love those guys. His solo records have been pretty good as well. I think the more recent, maybe there's been three actually. Oh, uh, yeah. I've, I've been... Uh, Worth a listen. Been hard to keep track of, but... Um, Danny Goffey, the drummer, has made a couple of really good solo records ah, as well. All right. Okay. Yeah. Worth to, checking out. I'll have to check that out as well. Very much in the... You can tell where the... You start to see who's doing what in the band exactly, when they yeah. separate. Yeah, Yeah, because... Sure. Gaz's records are quite um, quite experimental and, and mm-hmm. in terms of textures and synths and all that kind of stuff. And Danny's records are the more the snotty punk kind of yeah, like okay. new wavy, like little bit of madness kind of influence that going makes on. Sense. I guess they were just like 
they weren't the personalities that the Oasis blew. I mean, the the Gallagher brothers just dominated. Yeah, and then I guess Damon Albarn's like definitely some kind of artistic genius yeah, guy, yeah. and he's sort of cultivated that personality a little yeah. bit. But I guess Gaz Coombs just seems like a dude. <laughs> they were just yeah, they were just like. Yeah, so it never kind nice of nice dudes. Yeah, yeah, that what that doesn't like get you the press, does it? No, exactly. Or the notoriety. Yeah, I think the, the uh, I definitely had smoked pot previous, but one of the first times I had I smoked smoked pot was after a Supergrass show, and right. a friend. It was after my first UMI too, and he the the Supergrass's tour manager had tour managed UMI on our previous two and he was like oh do you want to meet the super supergrass guys and i was like oh do i like, this wow. would be great I, i'm going down there like i was already kind of pretty pissed because i was just so excited to see them but um but uh yeah and they were like oh they were really nice and i was like oh do you want to smoke do you, do you, you up for a joint and i'm like uh okay yeah that sounds great and being a novice pot smoker, I, 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 yeah, I, I fell, <laughs> fell prey to the, uh, you know, when you when you're pissed and you, you go, did you get really sick? Did you have to, I got oh, really that's sick. That's the worst. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Made it up the stairs of the forum, and then outside, and and the the, the steps up from the band room in the forum in Melbourne are really yeah, the, steep. Yeah, there's heaps of steps. That's right. <laughs> But, oh, um, that's the worst. That that like the greened out. So drug. why did I do that? <laughs> I did that so many times when I was a teenager. I just never really. It took me so long to learn my lesson. Right. I think also in New Zealand the weed was stronger and no one smoked spliffs. It was always straight. Yeah. So right. you just get and then heaps of um, bucket bongs and things like that yeah, as well. Yeah. Yep. 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 Oh, gross. Yeah. No, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> So what, so how did the, you end up in UMI? How did they find you? Um, I was doing uh, I was doing guitar tabs for their website because a, a friend was that a th- like I mean yeah I guess tab that's early days of websites as well kind it, of isn't absolutely it? that yeah. was like you know um, uh, geocities.com <laughs> slash nine seven five six zero zero nine seven five you know to get the, and you get these really like um, convoluted Whoa, HTML deep. addresses <clears throat> but a friend was doing their website and I'm, actually I don't think I knew him at the time but I remember looking up one of these websites and going oh I'd like to figure out how to play some UMI songs and I looked up the tabs and I, I realized oh i was like you know you just sit down and you kind of look, look and it's like nah this is they're, sound they're right. all wrong they're, they're all, all wrong. wrong for like for so many of those band, like bands back in the day eh? yeah it was all because pe- the only people who are willing to put the time into doing it are people that don't really know how to play guitar yet yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're always fucked yeah. And I, I actually, and this is later on after I joined UMI, I think I ended up doing a couple for, because um, we were on tour with She Had at the time, and I right. think I ended up doing, I think they, they were the last ones that I did. Like I got John Had to show me how to play play the songs, because they were all tuned down a whole step. Yeah, see, I wrote out a She Had tab back when I was a teenager in New Zealand. Yeah. But I just said it was in drop D and then now I can remember, I've listened to the song the other day, like I had it so wrong. Right, I, right. I know yeah, yeah. exactly what they're doing now that I'm a grown up. Yeah. But at the time I did it as well. That's so funny. Yeah. Because that's... <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, at the time it was, and you're first starting to learn guitar, you don't know that, you don't know that much about no. tunings and, and. I know, really, what, like, I remember staring at, the guitar player's hands really intensely when you were that age, right? Like trying to see exactly what it was that they were doing. Right, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's yeah, the same for me, having seen UMI a couple of times and watching Tim's hands and 
kind of like the shapes don't really always correlate to the chords, but then you know, they, then when when you figure out, oh, Tim loves Keith, Tim loves the Stones, so Tim loves Keith Richards, so like he's maybe doing a few, you know, like the and that's when that whole thing of open G different guitar tunings and and then there's a you know like to go down that the more you figure out and the more you get into like nick drake and Joni mitchell and all that kind Whoa, of thing yeah that's a whole other i've never i can't my brain can't deal with the different tunings i don't know what it right. is i just i don't know what shape i'm supposed to play so yeah. i don't know what to do <laughs> but sometimes that's Sometimes that's that's where, the beauty of it. You that's where the a, gold comes. Yeah, from. you play a C shape in those tunings, and it. Yeah, I, know, I think I just never remember what they are, and I'm just like, oh fuck it, just give me a normal tuning. And I, uh, yeah, I, well, I know what you mean with yeah with slides. Not many of your songs are in those tunings, are they? Um, not really. Generally, my my songs are are all straight up. I've been writing because I've been writing a lot more on piano of of late, so. How good are your piano chops? Not great. How good's not great? Um, I reckon you're probably pretty good. Well, good you're enough. Like McCartney good? Not McCartney good. Yeah, he's better than me. I too, can't. I, I can't play. Um, actually, like was it Martha? My idea. Like, I just spent the time to learn it. You can play it. Right. You, you definitely can? can. Yeah. It just takes the practice. amount of times I've tried, and it's like I can't. Let no, you just separate your hands, do them separately. You can do it. Right. Okay. Yeah. If I can do it, you can. Because yep. there's nothing. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> it's, you're gonna be fine. But it, it, piano. But he wrote it. I, I couldn't. Ex- I couldn't have written it. Fucking hell! Yeah, exactly. Um, I think piano chops, in terms of like, um, just inversions of chords, and yeah. you know, like I, I was lucky enough to put a tour together for Todd Runger in a few years ago. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this. So continue yeah. this, and then we'll get back to that. But just to see him on the piano showing you how to play those songs, I, my, I was like, okay, I think I can play piano as well as Todd Runger can. You know, like his his thing is about finding the inversions and yeah, sure, and, and like I, th- I can do that. And it opens me up into yeah, and you just got to go boom go boom go with your left hand, and then you just plod your right hand McCartney style. It's just, right, just, it's yeah. just like let it be, but sometimes it's faster or slower. Right, yeah. You don't yeah. really need to do much more than that. You know, I just had I was thinking, <laughs> you know, and then my dog came around and thought, you know, could make it a song about my dog. You know, <laughs> have you watched the trailer for Get Back? Oh man, yeah, I'm so excited. A couple of hundred times. Yeah, I, I was the same. <laughs> I watched it the first time, then everyone that I knew were like, you check, you got to watch this trailer. We're going, yeah, because I missed the first one. Like someone had play, said that there was one a year ago, and I was like, oh, I'll oh just, yeah, yeah, I'll just wait until it comes out. But then I saw the new one, and I yeah, got, it, it's it's pretty exciting. And you know, Peter Jackson um, having done that World War One, that was cool, eh? Oh, yeah, that was really hell. cool. And um, you know, and it, it, it's it's great that it's been put together as. You know, there's an arc to it, and there's a there's a narrative to it. Where it's like, I remember seeing that. I haven't original, seen. I haven't seen Let It Be. Oh, it's fucking horrible. It's yeah, awful. that's what I and heard. That's yeah, that's why it never got the like. It never got properly released. Is it just like bad, just badly done as well, or is it just, just a, badly edited? Badly and edited. It's yeah. just made to. You know, it's it's <clears throat> it's almost as though Michael Lindsay Hogg edited it to make you feel like you might have felt being right in their day after day after day. It's really like lots of long shots of, you know. Okay. Of Lennon with a ciggy just, <laughs> you know, glazed glazed but over. There's the good bit where George is, where there's like, it's like I'll, you know, I'll play what, tell me what you want me to play. I'll play what you want. Uh, I won't yeah. play if you don't want me to play. Just yeah, tell yeah, me yeah. You want I don't yeah. know that, but it's pretty classic. But yeah, I never got around to watching it either. But this, yeah, like that trailer paints it in, in mm. you know, and it's... And so it, it should now. It's like... Yeah, it's, exactly. Let's, let's just forget. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's a celebration now. Exactly, yeah. And there's this been, you know, people saying, oh, it's rewriting history. And so, well, no, it's documented. It's, yeah, it's, it's right yeah, it's, there. Like, it's, <laughs> we know what happened. There's... A, there's Many, yeah. many sto- like every one of them's got a different version of what happened. But exactly. Let's tell a nice one. It doesn't matter. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. They still made another record after that, right? So Exactly, yeah. Yeah, a, arguably their best. Their best, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. And what you guys are doing, so you know how to play all of those songs now. What's that? Let It Be. Let It Be? Yeah, you guys are doing it, aren't you, with Mark and... Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that... Who is it? Mark, a cram... And, and Darren Middleton. Darren, right. I met Darren finger. years ago, very briefly. He's right. a nice one. He's the nice he's, guy. He's, he's a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's oh, lovely. Right. Those are all nice guys, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, like, well, that's, we actually rehearsed for that and we were supposed to have... We were supposed to have already done it three times, but that's been, mm. you know, due to... Just, due to, just, due to, yeah, yeah. The, that, what shall not be. No named. one needs a couple of blokes sitting here to, to <laughs> tell everybody about. how weird the last eighteen months has been. Everyone knows. <laughs> uh, and you're, but you will do it. We will do it. Yeah, in May, I think. But and you did Abbey Road as well. We did Abbey Road, and which was <sighs> like Let It Be is like the the exhalation of relief after doing Abbey Road, being yeah. such it. Um, just that second half of Abbey Road, that, well, that's a nightmare. That was just like the hope for the best. Yeah. And see you at the end because... <laughs> see you at the end. I see so you at the end, in yeah. The end, but I love you. Did you do a little acoustic bit at the end? The Queen's yeah, I did, you. Her Majesty, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, McCartney just had to have the last say. Of course, yeah, yeah. You know, things. it'd be great just so, like, you know, it was meant to be in the middle. Just tack it on the end there. It's great, you know. But, um, yeah, that, that whole section. And also as well, because I think we had uh, some of the orchestra stra- some of the orchestra stuff on track as well. So right. it was like if something fucked up. We, it was, there was no, like, luckily we didn't. You got to can't miss a cue. <coughs> we can't miss a cue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Miami Horrors on track, and it has been since the beginning of time. And yeah, fuck, it used to piss me off sometimes. It's just no ever any room to wiggle anywhere. That's the yeah. Mm. I think like having a having a balance of, and I used to I used to be with using track stuff. I used to be so against it. I remember saying. Um, the Doves. Uh, oh, did and, they? Did they do it? Was it only, yeah, there's only ever three of them live, right? It, exactly. And their records yeah. sound huge. Yeah, and the Flaming Lips as well. Like you know, post um, Yoshimi and the Robots that that record and same. And there was a lot of track. And I remember going, "Oh, this is cheating. This this sucks. This is fucked." And that was you know, but that was kind of my mindset at the time. It's like. You now know. you realize that no one can afford it. Well, exactly. <laughs> it's just, it's yeah. like impossible to get. And if if the Beatles or, you know, if they had the the tech at the time to do that, then they, they probably would have done it. Yeah. But um Yeah, I I think a balance of if you if you're putting together a show like a a balance of, you know, if you're playing some more audacious kind of stuff where I have really gone to town on synthesizers and it's it's kind of nice to have a few of those elements in there. When I saw you at the Gasso, was there any track for that stuff? Because you had a Maybe keys player, a couple right? Of, yeah, we've got we had a, we've got a keys player, but maybe about four songs we play with okay. track. Like stuff where there is where we, yeah, we have overdubbed strings or I've got a whole bunch of synth stuff going on. Sometimes it's it's um it's synth bass on track as well, so we've got bass guitar and synth yeah, sure, bubbling okay. away. I enjoyed watching Soundgarden play um at the Maya Music Bowl for one of their reunion e shows. Oh wow, right. Because it was just rock and roll. And yeah. like they they do they don't overdo their records, but they definitely have lots of acoustics and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And just seeing the like four dudes rock version of it. Like, yeah. This is awesome. I don't want to hear any of the other shit. Sometimes Absolutely. that wins, right? Like sometimes you don't yeah. need to have all the bleeps and blops and it just sort yeah. of gets lost in the murk of a live mix anyway. And there's, you know, um, Kim Thale and Chris. He, he was like, <laughs> it's like, it seemed to me like he had, um, 
he had put the guitar down for a while, like like ten years or something. Right. Not yeah. not like he could still play like a motherfucker. Yeah. But he'd get to the end of solos, and it's like he'd lose control of the guitar, yeah. and he'd <laughs> like to turn the pedal off. It would take him a while to kind of yeah, get yeah, yeah. get it back in order. Yeah. You've wrestled the crocodile. Yeah. Man. yeah. How do I? Like- <laughs> yeah. Which I loved because it's like that, that's his style of guitar playing. Like exactly. Really yeah. wild, kind of out of time solo sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. really so psychedelic kind of um uh yeah i saw it i was like late late at night week, weeks ago and on youtube those uh rig rundowns came all oh, right one from a few years ago with it was while well, it was a sound garden one so it was my like christmas still alive Chris I guess. Was still alive yeah but um he but, loves an sg yeah that's right yeah uh, but and kim had those like kind of Guild guitars that that were SG kind of so, but uh, anyway, he had all these lots of ringing open tunings and yeah, they they were like like CG CG CC yeah, or something like I that. I think there was a time I remember reading an interview with they were doing a tour where every single song, every one of them needed to change guitar between every yeah <laughs> every single song yeah. I just can't get my head around the tuning thing. I don't know what it is. Maybe I would have some fun. But I think also I, I want to sound like the Beatles. So I feel like as soon as I do it, I'm going to sound like Nick Drake. And it's not a right. musical place that I really feel a need to go towards. And I think that's why that's I haven't done That's fair enough. It. Yeah. And also as well, like you you know, you, you, you play piano. So you can kind of, I think it's nice to be able to have... Um, to be across both, to to sometimes even uh, kind of different changes and inversions of chords and using like split chords and that kind totally. of thing doesn't come into guitar playing as much. But if you do have a knowledge of piano and you know, for, for me, of like with Todd Rundgren having figured out a few of his songs or like working out a Hall and Oates song or something like that, and it's like, oh, that's why because it's like a you know, a weird an A minor chord. Things you just wouldn't do on a guitar at all. Exactly. No, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of anyone playing normal guitar, you you can figure it out immediately, right? Like yeah. after this many years of playing, like there's nothing that anyone's doing that's particularly difficult or yeah. that we unless it is in some kind of open tuning. Yeah. So wait, how so how did the Todd Running thing come about? You you'd met him before or <coughs> um I'd supported him on tour. When he was um, here, when was, he was it? Was it the Johnson one? It was that one. Yeah, I, I went to that. I lasted twenty <laughs> minutes and I left. I do not blame you because yeah, here's this guy who's never been to Australia before, who's written some, you know, some of the greatest songs. <laughs> yeah, we were really disappointed. And and yeah, and I was it's I just blues, like straight down the line blues. It was just yeah, and not only just. You know, it's like old white man blues with yeah. chorus pedal. And, yeah, the uh, tone was kind of whack. It eh? was not, yeah. And yeah, we just went home and put on something, anything. It, after right. Scott got stoned and drank some beers. I'm like, this is what we need this to do. This is, yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, you did the right thing because you weren't getting any of something, nah, anything nah, of that show. <laughs> I know. But um, so I'd support him on, I'd met him. Yeah, obviously. So I'd met him prior to that and... He was coming out to Australia because he was doing... It was his 70th birthday and he was doing all these kind of... Um, uh, across. The, he did one in Scotland and one in the States in Virginia or something like that. They were like 70th birthday celebrations. And having been privy to the one like, well, from, from arm's length, the one that he did in Sydney, it's like, I can't believe that... I mean, the dedication that he has to his fans to kind of like go on a camping trip and just just be punished by your <laughs> by yeah, your fans true. to and I mean that in the in the most loving way cuz uh, you know no one's kind of but it's just like everyone wants you know everyone's hanging out and people are drinking and there's barbecues going on but everyone wants to everyone wants to have a chat to Todd yes. so so he was doing this one in Sydney and um a couple of the guys that were running that uh, got in touch with me because they'd heard, well, that I'd done this to a prior, but also that I was a big fan of Todd's, and they were like, um, 
would you be up for doing a um, uh, putting together a band just to play some songs on the last day of this like little three day camping trip? And I was like, yeah, of course. Like, you know, fuck. Even if it's like, even if it's pretty loose, or and it's just we'd only get one shot at it. Sure, but I'd worked out the um, worked out the um, you know a few friends of mine who had fellow. Who did you get? I got a um, friend of mine, Tony Featherstone, who okay. keyboard player who. He plays in a band called The Bad Loves. Well, did used to play in a band called who were like a bit more of a commercial rock band from the nineties. But okay. I played with Tony in um, Jimmy Barnes's band, right. going back a few years. So, and it was him who put me on to Todd. So, um, and that was so it was like that's a no brainer. He's yep. on yep. top of everything. Um, the bass player. Is an old friend of mine, um, Luke Hodgson. Who I know you, that name. You would definitely know him. Yeah, I do know that name. Anyway, yeah, yeah. he was... plays with. He plays with. Oh, he plays with everyone. He's played with Angus and Julie Stone, and um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. He's got a great. He's got a band called um, Mondo Freaks. Okay, um, which is really good. Um, yeah, he does a lot of great stuff, and um, he's also a big fan. And I've played with him o- over the years in a few different things. So it was just like, I love that guy to death, and yep. he's a big Todd fan, and he's a great hang. So, and a monster bass player. So it was, and um, and then um, I got um, Wolfie who plays drums in my band, right, and. <coughs> For me, it was just—I mean, you know, like he—he he loves Todd, and it sounds quite easy. Still, a lot of chords to learn. Well, that's, that's <laughs> easy to assemble the band, <laughs> but then hell. yeah, and that's the thing. Like Todd, thankfully, well, I had a um, a Zoom um, with Todd, and he was in. When did I, when did I speak to? Him? I think he was. He lives in Hawaii, but he was in Iceland. He was doing like a. Celebration of David Bowie, which right. um, how old is um, he now? What's how that? How old's Todd now? Uh, he's seventy. Well, when we did that tour, he just turned seventy. He's about seventy-three now. I think. Yeah, still doing it. Sprightly seventy-three-year-old. He's still smashing tours in the states, but <clears throat> but um, he kind of gave me carte blanche to to pick. The set list, and right? So, um, Fuck, which awesome. was cool because as fans, yeah, you just get to pick the the best ones, really, don't you? Like between you guys, you know what the people want to well, hear. Well, yeah, it. like we kind of like we didn't want to be disrespectful to to his more recent material, so we did a you know we did a bunch of songs off his current record at that time, which which yeah, which is really really like the songs we played are crackers. And we did some stuff off off his eighties records, um, but you know, like there was a good, uh, uh, you know, a, a little chunk of something, any, you know, good yeah. sizable chunk of something, anything. Did and Wolfman we, Jack make an appearance? No, we didn't do Wolfman Jack. I love that tune. There was a song called um, uh, "The Night the Carousel." Yeah, thing. I know that one. That's a great one. And we did we did that, and he'd never ever played it live. Oh, before right. Because he was just like he had this kind. He's got this kind of like. Almost like um, Leslie effect going on, where he played a piano and moved a microphone around the room while he's recording it, and he just he was just like I never ever thought to play it live because I just thought it would never work. Oh, that's so, a great tune. Yeah, it goes, it's like four and then it goes into a three, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Switches to the waltz sort of thing. It, and that's then, dun, dun, yeah. Dun, 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 and then it gets dun. really at the end it just sort of like cacophonous sort of it's, yeah yeah swirls around yeah i had some fun with with my memory yes. man pedals and um so yeah so that's how that that's how that came about and we put together a, a set for what was pers- pers- prospectively going to be just this one show but we um we thought, well, if we're going to put this show together and learn all these chords, then we yeah. <laughs> we might as well put on a few more shows. Definitely. So, 
So we ended up doing a yeah a, a uh, an Adelaide show and a, Mel- a couple of Melbourne shows and a proper Sydney show and so that way we were able to get a bit more you know get a bit uh, spend a bit more time and mm. and and was he happy with you guys' performance? He he was he I think so, I think so. He's you know and I remember speaking to the guys in the band beforehand and and saying look. In my like, Todd Todd had always been nice to me personally, but I can't I couldn't have imagined him being too demonstrable a guy. Like like if something sounded good, it would be like that's good. Yeah, I'll yeah. Move on. Not, Easy. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. There's no room for for you know, and I know like even from you know keeping in touch with Todd, we've done a couple of things subsequent. Like he's done, he's on your record. Yeah, and I'm on his record. Ah, cool. Coming up too. Wow, great. I yeah, to so, um, you know, he's uh, Todd's a Todd. You know, even just just being around the guy, there's a, there's a lot going on in that guy's head. I believe that, and he doesn't have a great deal of you know time like for you know just bullshit S- small, small talk. talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. He um, one thing I was like. I remember sitting around in the band room at the curtain and he was just going like, I was like, what's he doing? His eyes playing Angry Birds. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like, I, I let him finish his game and he, I was like, oh, do you like Angry Birds? And he was like, well, uh, I guess you could see that when I say that at two di- two separate times I've been the world record hole- holder for Angry Birds. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Under a pseudonym, he doesn't like, but he's uh, on two separate occasions. He's been held the the number one, the top <laughs> score for Angry Birds. So, yep, that does not yeah, a huge surprise. Kind of adds up in the most peculiar of ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you were in Crowded House for a minute. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, that was um, that was about three months touring around Europe, New well, Zealand, and did it say two thousand and seven? Or am I just making that up? No, that's okay. that's correct. Yeah, um, Liam had done the first half of the tour, and I think it was around the time Liam was just about to put his first solo record out. So yeah, okay, um, I ended up getting in touch with Neil um, via Jimmy Barnes, actually. Oh, yeah, they're really close. The Barneses and the Finns, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Because was playing with with Liam at the time. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, So I able to got a message through and go, oh, if you need someone, let... You know, and then, like, Neil called me. And there wasn't really an audition thing. It was... He was just like, I've spoken to... I'd met Nick Seymour before and, and... and hang out Everyone with them. just vouched for you. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we ended up um, ended up flying to um, flying to Auckland about a week before we were supposed to. We were set to fly out to Europe to start the tour because Neil was like, "Just hang hang out for a few days and and um, and um, and." And you know, like we'll, we'll we'll go through and play the songs together and work out the harmonies and all that kind of thing. Your own harmonies as well, yeah. Oh shit, yeah, yeah. Which was like, like sometimes now, like that having been, like fourteen years later, it's like, oh, I wish I could go back and like have another crack at it because I'm a lot more confident as a singer now than I was back then. So yeah, okay. to be able to just go, oh, just have that extra kind of like little bit of confidence in my own voice but um got to Auckland and um got out into the kind of um arrivals area and I kind of look around and I see like there's this group of people at a cafe and they're all like kind of pointing at and then I look to where they're pointing and there's like Neil looking at me waving his keys going I'm over I'm over here and it's just like oh so everyone's like oh there's Neil Finn and Neil Finn's like hey Davey over here <laughs> So we ended up, um, ended up, st- uh, yeah, ended up being at his place for like three or four days, and it was kind of surreal. Like I, I, you know, I hope he doesn't mind me 
sharing. Um, I've had Liam on the podcast. Uh, there you go. Cool. Well, <laughs> he's closer to the source than yeah. I am. So <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was staying in the downstairs place that um, did this little downstairs bungalow kind of area, and kind of got down and and woke up in the morning to uh, like the buzz, the intercom. And it's like, and it's like, Davey, it's Neil. I've made you bacon and eggs. And it's like, <laughs> fuck. Right. And then I got up and it's like, oh. And then I saw this room in the daylight and there's like a couple of tape machines. And then I go and have a look at the tape machines. And then it's like, you know, like pineapple head demo on it. Wow. And, you know, like not the girl you think you are demo. And it's like, holy fuck. <laughs> Damn. Oh, that's right. This guy, yeah. this, this is that guy. He's one of the greatest of yeah. all time. Yeah. So we um, we ended up going, and it, he just he just built um, Roundhead Studios at that point. So we <coughs> we went there, and um, I've never been there. It's it's nice, isn't it? It's something else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's that like in in the years um, subsequent to that, even Flash or now, then it probably yeah. was the end. And I speaking think- of Todd Rundgren, he. Um, the 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 Neve desk in Roundhead is the desk that was built for the Who, but was bought from the Who by Todd Rundgren, and it's oh, no. the <laughs> desk that he recorded "Bad Out of Hell" on. Bad. Oh yeah, I always forget that he, made, yeah. he produced that record. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Because I was looking at it the other day for some reason. Uh, it was because the. Um the AFL grand final had been on and then everyone was talking about, oh, they were like, it was as bad as meatloaf. Right. Or whatever. I was like, I've never seen the meatloaf one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I watched it and like, you know, it was bad. It was pretty bad. But the one, the one the other day was like, it's fine, wasn't it? I don't know why people were sort of slagging it off. It's like, oh, it, look, every, everyone, you know, arsehole, uh, opinions are like arseholes. Yeah, as they say. it was weird. Like you I know? watched Birds of Tokyo. They sounded good. You were singing in tune. Those things are so fucking hard to do, right? Like yeah. you're, you're all on an ears. There's no monitors. You're in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. This and audience is so far away. Uh, yeah. And that's the thing. Like, And, you know, like, you know how that is to kind of try and create this facade of, of yeah, totally. and it's not a word I like to use, but a facade of vibe when there is n- it's, yeah it's vibeless zero like yeah it's just um yeah and um you know but everyone's everyone likes being an armchair critic so <laughs> yeah it was weird i just found it weird though because i didn't i didn't think there was no one that was i mean i haven't watched all of it i watched eskimo joe i saw um, yeah um Baker Boy and yeah. the Birds of Tokyo. Yeah, I was like, they, you all, they all sounded fine. They all sounded good. Like they, yeah. they were playing these songs. No one was doing anything crazy. Yeah, exactly. So, what, what, what and it wasn't fun? like it was all to track either. Like it was like, I'm sure there were bits that were to, tra- sure, to yeah. track. But, but, like, but yeah, what was, what, why, 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 why the attack on everyone for that one? That was peculiar. I didn't know what. I what's that? The, I don't know why everyone's, why it was getting ragged on so much. I was like, did I, was there someone who was real bad that I missed? I didn't see John Butler. He's good. He can play guitar. Uh, he's a he's great, a prof- yeah. Yeah, he's a professional. He's a piece of, he's a professional, yeah, yeah. professional 12 string acoustic guitar player. Yeah, there's no way he was going to be bad. <laughs> But yeah, no, I don't think they were. Yeah, no, I think it's just like you know. Obviously, it's you know people go, oh, where's where's Sting? Yeah. Uh, bring back Bruce. You know, I don't think the Killers because the Killers had done it the year before. Well, I think. Yeah. Oh, the Killers. That's right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's cool. I th- maybe they should always have Australian people. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, I th- like that. There's been a lot of that talk recently of play more Australian music on on your hold music. Play it more on the tally. Just, right. Yeah. 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 Because we. And I think. That- Especially in, it's something that, you know, obviously with, with festivals, obviously it'll be a different case um, next year when everything starts to open up internationally. But, you know, there's that thing of, oh, we're really going to embrace Australian artists. And we did, um, UMI did a rugby grand final about 10 years ago. And it was this fucking hypocritical thing. They were like, oh, you know, like we'd, Love band, we love the you know Aussie Aussie band. So we're gonna get UMI, and we're like, oh wow, cool, okay, sweet. And it's like, you know, we may get some guest singers involved. So like Dan Sultan sung with us, and Phil Jamison. Okay, and, yeah. Um, and uh, and they were like, oh, can you do can you do a, like a medley of Stone songs? 
What? <laughs> it was like, it was one of those things I'm, sh- you know, I think we got paid for it. I don't know. But like, it was one of those things where, you know, it's like, all right, you go along with it. But like, this is so fucking ridiculous. We ended up doing a medley of Start Me Up. Um, brown sugar and so it was just like and I hope I, the paycheck was good because well yeah I, I don't remember being it, it being yeah, exorbitant like, like, yeah yeah it was you just, know, yeah exorbitantly for the for but it's you know there is a lot of that there's you know supporting Aussie musos and so and that's the thing that I experienced as well that doing <coughs> doing tribute shows like the Let It Be one and the, um, you know, Abbey Road or, like, you know, I'm I'm going on to a supporting a bunch of friends who are doing, like, one, a Carol King one and... Yeah, sure. They did that already. Are they doing more there's of There's more coming up. Yeah. yeah. Is Mark, is, is Mark, Mark in that? Yeah, Mark's... And then Louis Mark, in it as well. And Louis Macklin. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I was talking to Louis about it the other day. He said right. it was great the first run. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool! Oh, that's nice. I like. Yeah, I'm always um, happy when Louis getting more gigs. Yeah, no, I I love because Jet Louis. like the Jet thinks it has started again. I'm like, sweet, Louis back on to like playing the big shows again. You know? Yeah, then, yeah, that sort of died off again. I'm like, oh, god damn it! I love his, Louis got plenty of work. I just he's got his um he's got his I love his um the keyboard case that he's built. He built a keyboard case to to put his Nord inside. Right. That, Kind of made it look like a Hammond, and <coughs> and the other, um, I think for this Carol King show, the other keyboard player Claire Arano is a friend of mine too. Uh, she's using Louis, um, Louis, uh, Louis thing. It's so like I always call, oh, it's Louis keyboard case, as seen on Live with David Letterman. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was yes. just like this thing that he built. Out I know of a the few thing that you're talking pieces about. Pieces of yeah. wood that just yes. collapses out, and it's like. <laughs> yeah, oh, look, he, it's your cable case, as seen on Live with David Letterman. <laughs> True, he did Letterman with them, did he? Yeah, yeah. Fuck, I haven't seen that. i got to watch that. Yeah. Um, anyway, what we were talking about oh, before that. It's, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, I was looking on um, Jeff Barrow from Portishead's Instagram the other day. Oh, yeah, right. And he had posted this thing saying, you're on a first date with someone and they tell you the name of their favorite band and you immediately leave. What band is it? Oh, shit. And I remember that I'd been on, yeah. a, I'd been on a date with this girl once. I found her incredibly attractive. Yeah. But when she said that she... Um, Really loved Steven Tyler and thought that like Aerosmiths were the greatest band of all time. Like things quickly wrapped up and I really never spoke to her ever again. That's yeah. I, I will. I'm like I'm fine with Aerosmith, but she was like basically like, oh, Steven Tyler's just the greatest. He's a <laughs> genius. What an amazing man. I'm like, yeah, I don't I'm know. Not, if not sure about genius, that. Genius like Aerosmith. Yeah, great like, rock tunes. band. Yeah. you know, like a few killer tunes, but yeah, it's. Aerosmith seem an incredibly yeah like an, an odd band was, on a date was, to weird. to throw out there as mm. a um wow who do you hate well <laughs> I, like, I think like I, like I think after people. having seen the Woodstock '99 mm. um, thing that was finally after you know like after me having said that he enjoyed Limp Biscuits recent. Um, Lollapalooza set, but um, yeah, I don't know. There's just a whole glut of those bands, not not new metal bands, but just like <coughs> I, I the, I've always found, you know, I mean, and, and like douchey rock, douchey rock, sure. yeah, just kind of like, and the kid, kid um. I mean, I know it's like it's kid, just like Kid Rock didn't look. Kid Rock is like, like shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah, but yeah. Like, Monica Lewinsky can suck my dick. Or yeah, so yeah, so exactly. Much. Like it's like the guy's a fucking complete nufty. Yeah, and he's um and, and in that in the that doco does not paint him in a good light. And it was just like um uh, interviewed like a 
I watched girl. it. The, I watched it a few weeks ago as well. Right, yeah. and she's like, "Hey, yeah, you can play everything," and then they show him like on the decks, like doing a bit of scratching, and then like trying to play the drums, and yeah, it's that's just right. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that that kind of douchey, douchey. Yeah, it is do, kind do, of just douchey more rock more than anything. Bro rock, like it, it was very of the of the time, like stained and mm. Hoober stank mm. and um, <laughs> Hoober stank. <laughs> um, what I was think, the other one? The guys who did the uh, Alien Ant Farm, who did the cover of oh, Smooth, Smooth Criminal. Criminal. Yeah. That's <laughs> that was that wasn't so into that. Yeah. One. Um, what about the Chili Peppers? How do you feel about them? Well, you know. Flea, this is Flea's thing. lovable as a character, right? What's that? Flea's very lovable. He, yeah, he, he Flea's, Flea's, or Flea's, all right, because um, he plays with Tom York and he's played with like other people. You're like, Flea's great, so it makes the Chili Peppers harder to hate. And he knows his shit, and yeah. he's like, you know, it's obvious with his bass playing, he's gone deep, and like, yeah. you know, all the all the stuff that he, all that bootsy kind of like, he's yeah. There's no. Yeah, I mean, the Chili Peppers, I've, I don't know, for me it's, I actually wrote a song which is, I actually wrote a Chili Peppers song a couple of years ago. Okay. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was very, um, actually, I think it's Jerky's Twitter, which I think I might have, like, nicked the, um, 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 it might have been like I might have nicked the chords from something, but um, um, but it was all about the um, the Anthony Kiedis intervals. It was like free my mind, radio, <laughs> free my mind. Radio. Mm, that is it, that is on point. Yeah, yeah. You got to do more hammer-ons on the guitar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this. Yeah. <laughs> the, like yeah, faux Hendrixy kind yeah, of. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, yeah. This is a Martin, but it's not. It's not a Stratocaster. But um, no, I can hear it though. <coughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, Do you think if you can something... spoof someone, it means that they've done something really well, though? Well, yeah, and they've created something that's uniquely yeah, them. Yeah, I know. It's true. Yeah. I so, made a spoof Chili Pippa song not that long ago as well. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, more power to them. But the other thing I, I ask people is what song they could happily never hear ever again. Ooh. I'm starting to think Get Lucky could be mine. Yeah, right. Mm, I don't like Get Lucky. I never liked it. Ever. Okay. It always annoyed me. Something about the like, get lucky, get lucky, over, over Yeah, over, over, right. Over. It's, just, it's no. a bit too... And that's the thing, Pharrell's done some... He's great. Pretty amazing yeah, stuff. Yeah, Daft Punk, very good. No Rogers, sure, everyone. I, I loved Happy when I first heard it. Yeah. And then I heard... It. <laughs> yeah, it didn't go away, did it? Yeah. But yeah. The first time I heard Happy, it's like, oh, fuck, man, what a song. Like, he's, he's a dude. Um... What song could I gladly never hear again? Um, oh. Sweet Child of Mine. That's another one that I don't really need to hear. Uh, There's still something in that for you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Down, 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 down. Probably the bass line um, that I quite like. Um, mm, okay. Something that is, I don't know. Living on a Prayer? Living on a prayer, yeah, maybe something in that in that realm, in that mm. hair, in the hair realm. <laughs> the other one was uh, Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. Oh fuck yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, Ever had to knock on what one. other what other nineties ska rock can? It so is, this 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 the impression that I get the impression that I get. Is, <laughs> d- yeah, that's the Mighty Mighty. That's. <laughs> The Mighty Mighty Boss Tones one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. There was one other ska... Uh, who were the other ska band? There's one other one that had a hit around the same time. Anyway, I can't remember. Um, I've got Africa Toto on here, but that's not fair. I do like yeah, Africa I mean, Toto. I, yeah, I, I I, love... I do like that song as a... 
as a as a piece of songwriting and recorded work is fucking amazing. But yeah, I mean, in the last ten years, it's just been yeah, there's co opted a, a little too it. much. Maybe I could. I reckon if Hotel California, if I never heard that ever again, I wouldn't. Yeah, be, I wouldn't be upset. Yeah, about true. It. Mm. Oh, American Pie. Mm. Those two, and it go goes for fucking ever. Way too, too long. Yeah. Way too long. <laughs> Yeah, those two. Someone else said that to me. And also, Don McLean. I've, the more I read about that guy, the more I, like, he's cut his daughter off or something like that because she's. She, I don't know. Like, he, I, yeah, I get the feeling he's not a very nice pers- person. Ah, interesting. <laughs> he's boys of summer when he went by himself. Is that no? Him? Don, Don Henley oh. from Don Henley, also of the Eagles. Yeah, so there's Don McLean and Don Henley and the Eagles. Yeah. Right, which one's Don McLean? Don McLean. Don McLean's American Pie. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm getting... Yeah, here. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That one's all right. Oh, yeah, Boys of Summer. Yeah, that Pretty one's good. okay. So Don McLean, yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. There's not too many that drive me mental, but there's a few... Yeah, there's just some of them. I think, yeah, I... F- I mean, even you know, like we we're talking about how much I love the Beatles. I I could like, I could be be pretty happy to not hear "Oh Bloody Oh Oh Blada." That one's kind of shit, eh? Yeah, yeah. And it's it, going to see Macca play as well. It's like seeing the amount of people that just when he like ding da da ding da da ding da da do boom da do 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 the amount of people just go crazy for it. And so, wait, you just fucking played? Maybe I'm amazed, like. <laughs> or 1985 like those you know but that's white album isn't it yeah yeah there's a few dodgy mccartney's on white album yeah yeah good record maybe what they say well maxwell silver hammer as well like just the mccartney being mccartney you know, yeah his vaudeville like yeah i don't you know as the, the rest of the beatles didn't even like those songs no like, yeah like, well exactly <laughs> like you know, Lennon would say, nobody likes your shizzy grand, grandma music, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, fuck. You've got eye partridge. We need to talk about Alan. Yeah. Before when you mentioned um, Wings, I remember you said at your gig, and, I, and then I, I was, it was like, what, the band? That the Only Beatles, the band the Beatles was could have been. <laughs> and I hadn't heard him do that bit yet. And then I w- went back and rewatched all Alan Partridge. And when I. Oh, man. <laughs> I've actually, I've got the, um, I know that book almost uh, off by heart because I've, I mean, I've read the book, but I've got his, the audio book of, right. he, of part of Alan Partridge reading it. It's fucking hilarious. It's so good. Yeah. And I the know. way he recounts stories that are in the show, but mm. completely skewed as yeah. well as from his. I know. <laughs> it's amazing. The new one, um, this time with Alan Partridge, yeah. that was good as well. Yeah, it's all it's all really, really um, yeah, really, really good. Kogan's a genius. Hey, that's plenty. We're, we're, that's that's enough. We'll call. Yeah, that. no yeah, worries. Yeah, push the mic all good. That both Davy and I have both made Chili Peppers spoof songs. That cracks me up. Free my mind. Radio. Uh, here's a little excerpt of it. Thanks, Davy. What a lovely chat. Was really glad we got to connect properly. It's looking like we're going to watch the new Beatles doco get back sometime in the next few weeks together and keep the dream alive. Uh, if you haven't, check out Davy's latest record, Don't Bank Your Heart on It. There was also the excuse me, the latest UMI record that they made remotely during lockdown, which is sick. I've also linked a bunch of clips, etc. in the podcast description to things we talked about in some of Davey's tunes. He's actually just put out a new EP as well, Ragging on Your Chords. It's called The Man Does Not Stop. 
Shit, yeah, so that's it. All right, thank you for today. Pleasure to have you. Rex, there will be a uh, Rex. Oh, my God. I reckon there will be another episode in a month. It's getting a little harder to pin people down these days. What with the 4 billion other podcasts on the internet now? But I'm trying not to let that deter me. Uh, the bottom of it, I'll try and make it prevail. Got to do my best, but jeez. We need some more podcasts, guys. What do you reckon? Let's get some more. How about that? Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Till next time, stay, stay safe. And oh, what have I got written down here? Try not to go too far down any, in, any internet rabbit holes. I think it can be a little dangerous for you. All right. Until next time, see you. Take care. Talk soon. Goodbye.